stint that holding. So we're going to go up when 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 Jim goes up. I don't care. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> Well, good evening. Welcome to Macomb Community College. Uh, we uh, appreciate you braving the weather this evening and, um, and joining us tonight. We're also being um, uh, uh, we're available on the online. We're available online as well. So, welcome to those folks. Uh, my name is Jim Sawyer. I'm the uh, president here at Macomb Community College. Uh, on behalf of our board of trustees, faculty, and staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. Uh, before we begin, there's a few folks I'd like to introduce. I'll start with our board chairperson, Catherine Lorenzo. <laughs> board vice chairperson, Frank Cusimano. <laughs> Trustee Shelley Vitale. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce two other special guests, <laughs> President Emeritus Jim Jacobs. <laughs> and President Emeritus Al Lorenzo. So we really appreciate the opportunity that Brookings provided us to, to host this event. Uh, it's it's, it's a tremendous uh, accolades for us to be able to bring the caliber of speakers here, to have someone like uh, Janet Yellen here to share her thoughts on the economy and the intersection with the 2020 election. It's just fabulous. David Wessel is a leader in this, uh, this work as well, so we feel very proud to have them here. David will introduce the rest of the panelists shortly. You have their bios in your, in your uh, detailed agenda. You know, Macomb County, we really recognize as we get closer to the election in November, well, there'll be a lot of tension paid on our county, right? We know that we're kind of a bellwether to the politics going forward, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what transpires over the next nine months. And we really see this as a fantastic kickoff to really give our community an opportunity to hear from literally experts in the field and see what the impact is of the, uh, of the economy and how that may intertwine with the election. So with that, it's my honor to turn this over to David. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's very good to be here. Uh, we no longer have snow in Washington, D.C. So we <laughs> asked the college, what is the time when we're most likely to have snow? And they picked this date. So I just want to thank you for providing that. Although, if our plane doesn't take off, my attitude may change. <laughs> Uh, I have a, a long-standing uh, interest in relationship with Macomb Community Colleges. Uh, I think that uh, I often say that uh, America excels in higher education, but the future of the middle class in America has a lot more to do with what happens at places like Macomb Community College than it does at Harvard and Princeton and Yale. And so what I think happens here is fundamental to the future of our country. And uh, to tell you a secret, community colleges come in varying degrees of quality, um, but this one is at the very top of the list. So you should be all proud that your county supports an institution like this. Um, <coughs> Brookings is a think tank in Washington, uh, and a think tank is basically something like a university without students, uh, which uh, <laughs> cuts down on the workload some. Uh, <laughs> But uh, one of our goals is to provide uh, thoughtful, fact-based, analytical, nonpartisan insight into major public policy issues. And as you may have noticed, it's kind of hard to have your voice heard among the screaming uh, these days when you want to say, okay, what's this really about? So this Policy 2020 project is our attempt to do that. We have a series of uh, uh, sort of FAQ style things on a variety of public policies online. And we're, this is the first of a series of events we're gonna do uh, to get outside of Washington. And 
as uh, President Sawyer said, basically the entire future of the country rests in who you vote for for president here in Macomb County. So take that seriously. We hope to help you make that decision uh, based on policies, not on, on candidates or partisanship. I I'm very pleased to have Janet Yellen here. Janet Yellen, as you all know, is uh, the former chair of the Federal Reserve. She's a colleague of mine at Brookings. She also happens to be president of the American Economic Association uh, this year. And so I thought I'd ask her a few questions, and then we'll have time to have some questions from, from you all before we're joined by our panel, which I'll introduce later. Uh, so Janet, um, I know what the topic of this thing is, but I think that there's just an awful lot of angst about the coronavirus. So I wonder if we could start with, so what, uh, neither you nor I nor anybody on the panel is an epidemiologist. So we're not gonna tell you what's gonna happen. Um, and if we do tell you, you should not take it seriously. But <laughs> uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what kind of risks does a, a virus like this pose to the U.S. economy in particular, and what kind of tools do uh, economic policymakers, the Fed and others, have to respond if this turns out to be something that spreads to the United States? Sure. Well, let me, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty, and it will <laughs> depend on how this epidemiologically um, evolves over time. Um, we have a global economy that's been pretty weak. And um, a weak global economy, even before the coronavirus hit, was a source of drag on the US economy. Um, it's created kind of a manufacturing recession of sorts in the United States. But consumer spending has been very strong. The service sector has been doing very well. The US economy has continued to perform quite well, and before this hit, it seemed like the global economy um, was stabilizing and maybe beginning to recover. The outlook for the U.S. looked quite good. Um, I would have thought the odds of a recession are very low. Now, this is clearly something that's had a very significant impact on China. Uh, it may continue to do so for longer. Um, I think if the impact were limited to China, um, this would probably be something that um, would have some impact on the global economy, but relatively little on the U.S. We're not that exposed to the global economy, although it does make a difference. But now it seems like um, the virus is extended into Italy, into other parts of Europe, into the Middle East, and it's spreading. And um, it's having two kinds of effects at this point on the economy. One on the supply side, we have global supply chains, and so many firms um, that make things um, it, based on supply chains getting parts from all over the world. And China is an important part of that. In Korea, where we now have the virus, is also a very important part of that. And it looks like with the factory shutdowns that have taken place, um, there will be an impact on ability to continue to make products um, given shortages of parts and supplies. The other piece of it is the d impact on demand. Obviously, when people are quarantined and not traveling and trying to avoid the virus, um, they stop spending, and they stop spending on parts of the economy that have been the strength, um, both here and globally, um, tourism, um, tra travel, um, consumer spending will take a hit. And so, um, you know, depending on how serious this gets, um, I think, you know, we could see significant impact on Europe, which has been um, weak to start with. And it's just conceivable that it could throw the United States into a recession. I think if it doesn't hit in a su substantial way in the United States, that's less likely. Um, we had a pretty solid outlook before this happened, and there is some risk, but, um, you know, basically I think the U.S. outlook looks pretty good. You said what can, what can policymakers do? And in terms of economic policy, you see to today the 10-year Treasury yield fell to about 134, which is about its lowest level in all of history, and part of that is that market participants will look to the Fed to provide some support. 
In most developed countries, interest rates are really low. And they're very low in the United States, but higher than they are in most other developed economies. And the Fed does have some scope. It's not a cure-all, um, but it, it will provide a little bit of support um, to consumer spending and to the US economy and to financial markets. Um, and of course, if it becomes very serious, fiscal policy um, could play a more active role yeah. too. Good. So uh, when you look at the overall uh, numbers on the US economy, it looks pretty darn good. 50 year low on unemployment. Uh, we're creating 180, 190,000 jobs a month. The fraction of workers who are working part time and prefer to work full time has fallen quite a bit to now lower than it was before the Great Recession. Wages are finally beginning to climb, including wages at the bottom, particularly maybe because of the minimum wage. Um, uh, we have very <coughs> little inflation. We are, this is, we've never gone this long and since we started keeping track in the mid 19th century without a recession. So on one hand, if you were just getting the basic vital signs on the economy, it feels really good. On the other hand, uh, an awful lot of people seem to be uh, unhappy and struggling. Uh, I think the support for Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump suggests that they're not happy with the way things are going. Uh, how do you, wh what is the problem here? Why is it if the economy is so strong and the job market is so good, so many people seem so distressed and they're, they're not satisfied? Well, it's a glass half uh, full, glass half empty story. And I think you did a great job of discussing the way in which the glass is half full. We do have the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. Jobs are plentiful. Um, people feel good about their ability to get a job. Um, firms, you talk to almost any manager of a firm, it's darn hard to find qualified workers. That makes firms much more willing to engage in um, training. And my experience around the country has been that a lot of companies are looking to partner with community colleges, with nonprofits, um, to start up training programs um, that can turn out the kind of people who have the skills that they want. And that is a permanent benefit um, to, the work, to the workforce. Even if the economy were to weaken, if that's something that lasts a long time, getting training, building skills, um, people coming back into the labor market um, who had left it, that's really a positive. Okay, so that's the good side of things. The bad side of things is, let me give you two, um, what I would consider horrifying statistics. The median American male has seen no increase in real wages, and wages adjusted for inflation in 50, 50 years, 50 years. And the median American male who does not have a college education has seen their wages decline by 13% over 50 years. And in terms of intergenerational mobility, um, in my generation, um, most kids did better than their parents. And their parents, that's what the kids expected, that's what their parents expected. And um, gave people the sense we're getting ahead and we're progressing. And that just isn't true anymore. About half of, um, half of young people will not do as well as their parents have done. And of course we see um, in an environment in which jobs, middle income jobs, have gradually dis disappeared over time. Um, what, I mean, what's, go what's going on? I think what's driving it is first and foremost, technological changes that have um, rewarded and demanded more skill. So that um, people with more education and skill are benefiting from the technology, they're getting ahead. And um, the technological changes plus globalization and trade, but that I would say to a lesser extent than just the nature of technological change, it's replacing workers who have less skills. And I think that's something that's been happening for a long time and is going to continue to happen um, in the future. 
And so people are seeing their jobs disappear. And well, there is work, the work um, that's available to people um, who have a high school education or lack, lack greater education than that. Um, we've created, you said, 180,000 jobs a month. I think since the recovery started, the economy's created about 16 million jobs. But something like 3 million of those jobs were for individuals with less than a college education. So the jobs that are being created are high-skilled jobs, and those who lack the skills are just seeing the jobs that they had that gave them security disappear and um, being replaced by jobs that are insecure and tend to be low wage. And so that's been going on for a long time and it's making people feel insecure. You're, you're seeing um, in t until recently both men and women, their participation, but particularly men in the labor force declining. And of course, you know, we know we have an opioid epidemic um, so the prevalence of alcohol suicide, um, so-called deaths of despair. We've actually seen among um, middle-aged individuals, um, whites in the United States, and this is particularly true for those with high school or less education, in recent years we've actually seen mortality rates rise, which is almost un unheard of in a developed country, and we're not seeing that anywhere else um, around the world, and it ref reflects, I think, the broad-based um, negative impacts of these, these adverse trends that are not recent. When I say we're going back 50 years where this goes way back that these trends began to negatively affect the workforce. So to what extent do you think trade and globalization has contributed to this? You mentioned technology. I, I think I'd put technology at the top of the list, but I think globalization and trade have reinforced that. And um, particularly um, when China came into the uh, WTO um, and export surge to the United States, economists have documented that there was a good deal of displacement. But um, I, I think the combination of trade and technological change have had that adverse impact. So what policies do you think stand a chance of sharing the prosperity more broadly so that if 10 years from now we're having this conversation, we can say that the median incomes of American workers are rising rather than just uh, the ones at the top? So I don't believe there's a silver bullet, but at the top of my list, when you're seeing wages rise to those with more skill and stagnate or decline to those with less, that seems to be a signal that is saying loud and clear, we have to do a better job of equipping um, young people with the skills they need to succeed in the labor market. And um, that's what you, your enterprise is here, and it's the most important one of making sure that it, but it's both young people who are entering the labor force, but also individuals who have been displaced who are not feeling um, satisfied with their careers or um, seeing job loss and need to acquire new skills, the importance of giving them the opportunity to acquire the skills they need to succeed in the labor force. So that hits my list. But, you know, we could be doing more to support people also. And when you compare the United States with other countries, particularly in Europe, um, that are undergoing the same kinds of structural changes. You, you, you do see high unemployment often, youth unemployment, um, in European countries, but you don't see um, as much distress and income loss as you do in the United States. You know, we haven't raised the minimum wage since 2009. It still stands at $7.25 an hour, and a number of states and localities maybe half around the country have increased the minimum wage, but that's certainly something we could be thinking about. Um, supporting incomes of people who work through the earned income tax credit and dealing with the things that really are such a tremendous concern to so many um, people, um, healthcare, 
cost of housing, and particularly in places where um, the jobs are. Uh, often, housing is unaffordably expensive, and it isn't possible for people with lower income to be able to move to those. But improving the social safety net, and, and as well as training and education. What about unions? Um, well, I think partly the decline of unions is a reflection of these trends and the fact that we haven't leaned against them. But um, certainly, I think unions can be helpful in countering these trends. Let me ask you one more question before we turn to the audience. Um, in your jobs at the Federal Reserve, most of your time was spent on issues of inflation and unemployment and financial stability, banks, and in, you name it. Um, I, I was a little surprised when I talked to you a few days ago that when I asked you how much do you worry about climate change, um, you said my hair should be on fire. Um, what, what, uh, that's not usually a thing that economists or central bankers worry about. <laughs> uh, you've been, maybe they worry about hair, but not <laughs> climate change. Um, uh, you've been active in some of these efforts to address climate change. And I'm just curious about what motivated you to do that? Well, I, I would say that I became involved and more knowledgeable about climate change is an issue when I worked in the White House in the Clinton administration and we were negotiating the Kyoto Treaty um, and I was involved in um, those, those discussions. And I learned then how serious a problem climate change is. And I must say I've been extremely distressed both to see how little um, the United States has done, and most countries around the world, but the United States has been really resistant to taking um, the actions that I think we need to combat it. And meanwhile, the consequences have become more obvious every day to almost everybody. When you see so many extreme weather events, these um, wildfires that have become uncontrollable in Australia. You're seeing some of the same things um, happening in California. We're seeing melting of um, the Antarctic ice sheet and some of the um, ice, ice in the Arctic, um, the spread of mosquitoes <coughs> carrying illness is increased, sea level rise. Um, I don't know of any, really anyone who's looking at the facts who questions that this is something that is caused by human activity and will continue. And it's one of the hardest possible problems to deal with because it really requires global cooperation. Um, it's not enough for the United States to do something if that's offset by what other countries do where they don't pitch in. Um, we can't solve this problem, and it's natural for countries to want to be free riders. But the United States has been such a significant part of this problem and contributed to it so much that I really believe we have to show leadership. And when you start looking at the numbers, um, essentially, the, in Paris, um, the countries of the world set as a goal that they would hope to confine the increase in average global temperatures from um, pre-industrial revolution to two degrees um, centigrade and if possible, one and a half degrees centigrade. And the most recent calculations suggest that the entire world would have to become carbon neutral. Namely, we'd have to cut net global emissions to zero by 2050 in order to achieve that goal. And when you think about what would be required for the entire globe to become carbon neutral by 2050, it, it's almost impossible to imagine that that's going to happen. And the consequences of this are very, very serious. And we're so far behind in doing anything, you know, I believe we should all have our hair on fire on it. So we're going to take some questions, and I, we have a few minutes. So I propose there's a mic here. I'm going to take three questions, and then we'll let Janet answer them. So uh, you want to start with the woman in the blue there, Camila? The mic's coming to you. And why don't you tell us who you are? Paula Druick, uh, retired Macomb faculty. 
Um, given the gap that you have noted between the resources we have and the skill level of jobs, do you think that part of the resistance for this kind of education which we need and which Macomb, of course, is dedicated to is a possible result of a kind of intellectualism in the popular mindset? That's the gist of my question. So you mean uh, I don't want my kid to go work in a factory. I want him to get a, 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 a bachelor's degree. No, at, I think it uh, would be uh, uh, the resistance of of uh, being an egghead or a nerd or the other kinds I of see. epithets that are thrown against people who are intelligent, eager to learn, and out there trying to better themselves. Thank you. The one over here, I saw a hand, I think. Here's one here. Camillo, is there one over here? You had a question before. Uh, go ahead, sir. Dr. Yellen, I want to congratulate you for being probably the most intelligent woman ever to work in Washington, D.C. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And it's a pleasure to be in your presence. Thank you so much. That's but my very question to you is, we know the consumer debt is all-time high. We know the government debt is all-time high. What do you think is going to happen when the people in this country can no longer afford $60,000 SUVs and pickup trucks. I think we're going to have a problem. Thank you. There's one over there, Camilla, uh, another blue shirt. My name's Gordon Hall. Is this on? It's on. My name's Gordon Hall. I'm a retired IT uh, person, and I'm 80, so I've seen this whole arc that you were talking about. Uh, and things, uh, I went uh, on a, uh, my father's middle, middle income. I went to a boarding school, I went to college. Uh, uh, I've had uh, solid benefits uh, and p pensions and health insurance. And thanks to Medicare and our pensions and so on, we're very well off now. But I don't see any of those being spread farther around, they seem to be shrinking. And it seems to be uh, not just a matter of getting more training, but everything, like colleges are now not open to an average person. And uh, 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 what was, what's the difference now between the scenario then and, mm -hmm. and creating something like a scenario like that now? Great, those are great questions. So why don't we take them in order. Uh, the first question was basically, do we have some kind of social attitude that discourages people from getting education? Well, I, I think Americans have gotten more education. The fraction of people who um, are getting higher education have gone to college has been, um, that has been increasing and that has somewhat helped to hold up wages at the, at the lower end of the spectrum. But, um, you know, and I, I think we do appreciate, most people do appreciate the importance of um, getting higher education, of acquiring skills um, in order to be successful in the job market. Um, you know, many, lots of men probably hoped that they would be able to have um, you know, with less education, a high school education, a good manufacturing job um, with solid benefits of the kind their fathers might have gotten. And it's probably taken a long time for a lot of people to realize that um, that's a future that is not going to be there for most people and that the skills they need to acquire are much, much greater than that to be able to succeed. But um, I do think there's a broad recognition that it's necessary and appropriate. So what do you think changed that made it possible for this gentleman to have a middle class life and he's worried about the next generation? What is it that explains the change in the economy and our social system? You have a thought? <laughs> <laughs> we had a deal earlier if there was a hard question 
I would answer it because as a former newspaper reporter, I don't have any problem answering questions <laughs> I don't know anything about. <laughs> She's more cautious. So, well, I think what you gave you think? some part of the answer. Part of it is the economy's changed, and we haven't changed enough with it. And part of it is we tolerate a level of inequality in the United States that was not tolerable 50 years ago. I, I, think, that, I think that is true. And you, you do see in most developed countries around the world that there's less willingness to tolerate this kind of rising, rising inequality. Right. Um, you know, we have a health care system and a pension system that um, historically it's very much tied to people's jobs and is secure jobs for middle income people have disappeared. I think that's translated into a lot more concern about will I have health care? How can I get health care if I don't have a job that offers it? And um, we don't have a system that uh, gives people health care and pension benefits if um, they're not in jobs that offer it. And so I think that's increased in security as well. And do you worry about uh, the United States business, households, and government having too much debt and it's going to kill us in the end? So that's, that's an important question. I think on the consumer side, we have seen some kinds of debt rise a lot, particularly auto debt. There's an awful lot of um, big increase in auto lending. But since the crisis, um, mortgage debt relative to income has declined a lot. And overall, debt burdens for households. So if you look at um, monthly financial obligations that households have when it, to make payments to pay down or pay their interest or pay down debt, that has fallen dramatically since the financial crisis, partly because mortgage debt has declined, but also partly because we're in a world of very low interest rates. So, you know, consumer spending is supporting the economy. In the run-up to the financial crisis, a lot of it was debt-fueled. People were using their houses like piggy banks, taking out home equity, um, lines of credit, and really spending not based on their income, but based on the value of their homes. That's not what's happening now. Spending is strong. It's based almost completely on jobs, incomes that people have, and um, really not, not so much based on debt. So I'm not very worried about households. The government, um, the government also has a lot of debt. The, the amount of federal debt has doubled relative to the economy since the financial crisis. The U.S. debt to GDP ratio was about 40 percent um, pre-crisis, and now it's about 80 percent. And 80 percent, um, historically, it's the kind of number that would make financial markets flash orange or even red, that that's getting awful close to what can bring on a debt crisis in a country. But look, today, the 10-year Treasury rate hit 135, which is, I believe, the lowest it's ever been in the history of the country. So you can see that financial markets are looking at an 80% debt to GDP ratio, and they're not saying, oh, this is a country that's about to default. Well, you know, we are in a very low interest rate environment, and so even though debt has doubled relative to the economy, federal government debt has doubled, uh, the interest burden on that debt hasn't gone up at all. It's actually declined ever so slightly because interest rates are so low. And the truth is they're expected to stay low for a long time. So um, I do worry in many ways about the trajectory of the deficit going forward. We still have large deficits. And as our population ages and spending on Social Security and Medicare go up, um, the deficit is slated to get worse, and I do think it's something we need to address. But in this, especially in this low interest rate environment, um, I don't think that the current debt situation rates is you know, that high on my list of what I think American priorities should be addressing okay. that. Let me invite my, the three other panelists up. Um, So we're going to talk for a while, and then we'll have time for more questions. So 
first here is Molly Kinder, who's a colleague of mine at Brookings. Uh, she's uh, a Rubenstein Fellow. Uh, is a, we have a number of people who come mid-career for a couple Let's of years. Um, and you can read about her in her uh, in the little brochure. But what you won't read in the brochure is that her father, Drew, is here. And he drove all the way from Buffalo <laughs> to be here today. <laughs> It's kind of set a frightening example for me. I'm trying to imagine doing this for one of my kids. So <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, we're joined by a couple of people from your community. Uh, J.P. Ray, who's the um, uh, Deputy County Executive in Macomb County, and Sandy, uh, who's the uh, head of the Detroit Chamber of Commerce, and among other things, uh, former administrator of the FDA and several other jobs in Washington. So if you don't like what's going on in Washington, talk to him. <laughs> Molly's still Wasn't there. That it's, her it's her fault. Right. Um, so Molly, I want to start with you sure. because you've done some really interesting work. Um, Janet and I are um, students of the numbers on the economy, but you've spent a lot of time talking to workers. So I wondered if you could um, discuss the question that we discussed, which is what is it that's uh, on the minds of so many workers, particularly workers in the lower half of the, of the wage distribution. Great, thanks David. Well, first of all, it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, I love this topic of this question, of this panel, because it is so on the minds of workers all across this country. Um, before I started at Brookings, last summer I led a project at New America where I led a team where we traveled the country and we talked to dozens of workers who hold some of those jobs that we're talking about. They're at the lower um, end of the wage spectrum. And going to what we just heard from Janet Yellen, in some of these occupations that stand to change the most from technology. And in fact, they're the most common occupations in most communities, including here in the greater Detroit area. So fast food workers, retail workers, folks at grocery stores. I also talked to administrative workers. Um, and really, the headline there reflects, I'm just going to quickly go to a number first before I get into the stories. Um, my colleagues at Brookings found that in this area, in the greater Detroit area, 42% of all workers hold low-wage jobs. And the median hourly wage for that group of workers, that 42%, is going to probably surprise you. It's $9.94 an hour. So just imagine what that's like to, to try to provide for a family and to pay your bills on that salary. Um, those were the workers that I talked to across the country, in Indianapolis and in Buffalo and in the Bay Area and Washington, D.C. And there were a few uh, things that really stood out. First is that those wages mean that workers are feeling a lot of insecurity. <laughs> they live with a very precarious circumstances, and what that meant to them was um, it was a real struggle to pay bills especially in the more expensive regions, the length people went to just afford housing was just extraordinary. Um, you know, married couples living with multiple roommates, living far away, long commutes, it was really, really a struggle. Um, there was a real feeling that their, their money just doesn't stretch far enough, and then in fact it's getting harder over time. Um, and really what that meant, the anxiety, was that people were just one unexpected expense away from being tipping over the edge. So stories of you know, a young person who worked at a grocery store telling me, I've got a car, that's the only way I get to work. Um, it's not a good car, I have no savings. If something happens to this car, I have no way to get to work. Um, folks, a lot of youngsters who had dropped out of community colleges because of unexpected financial expenses. So these hardships really meant a lot in people's lives. They felt very precarious. I heard over and over how impossible it was to save and how people had no financial cushion. Um, the second thing was that people t spoke to that anxiety. We heard just this discussion of how technology um, is a factor. And this is not an academic discussion. Um, the folks that I interviewed know that those jobs are changing. In fact, they described their own workplaces being temporarily paused for renovations. They see Uber Eats starting or self-checkouts, um, mobile payment. They, many workers spoke to um, hearing newspaper, reading newspaper stories about the cashierless Amazon Go opening in Seattle. Um, they know technology is coming, and in fact, they were deeply pessimistic for what it looked like in the long term for humans in those workplaces. Um, and that fed in, that was an extension of a deeper feeling that they had, which is so many of these workers 
felt that when they showed up in their workplace, that they were a cost that their employer was trying to get rid of, and they weren't really valued. Um, and that really technology was just another way, in addition to maybe cutting back benefits, um, that really that they were see they didn't feel that they actually mattered at the end of the day as a human in those workplaces. So I, I picked up a lot of economic precarity, a lot of struggle, and then also some uncertainty um, and concerns about what the future looks like. Um, JP, you told me on the phone that the biggest problem in the labor market here is you have more jobs than you have qualified people to fill them. So how can that be? Uh, that's why Brookings is here, I thought. So <laughs> <laughs> we brought in the big guns. Okay. Now, uh, I guess as the uh, Macomb County representative on the pa panel, thank you all for coming to the east side. Um, it is an absolute thrill not only to be able to have this conversation here, but not only see someone like Janet Yellen speak to some of these macro trends that we're tracking and trying to say, okay, as a county that is the third largest in the state of Michigan with 880,000 individuals and 18,000 businesses where you shop for groceries, okay, highest population that we've ever had, highest educational attainment that we've ever had, increases in diversity and inclusion that we've never seen in the county's history with an integration of people both domestically and internationally. Workforce that's above 440,000 individuals, which is larger than some states, some of the most dynamic skill sets and the greatest concentration of thought leadership in industries that are changing every single second of every single day. We have 35,000 unfilled jobs as we sit here today. And when we look at that number, it is a stark reality into multiple trends of disruption that we're seeing across so many different industries. You know, you spoke a little bit earlier into the training and the skills gaps. Look, I think we're faced with the daunting reality that the traditional way that we view education, I think, is changing because we need to be skills ready in industries that are changing at so much more fr frantic of a pace. And I think that's why it's absolutely critical that we're forging partnerships on a daily basis with the community college and Dr. Sawyer and his team and our uh, intermediate school district, which oversees 150,000 kids in our K through 12 system and linking that to Detroit Drives degree at the regional chamber because we need to look at micro-credentialing. We need to understand that when a company comes to us and says, I need more systems engineers than every single Big Ten school can provide us over the next 10 years to fulfill a multi-billion dollar DOD contract, I can't cash that check on behalf of our community. And that's workers that we not only have to source and bring together a, a full slate of economic incentives and quality of in place incentives that will ensure that company not only remains competitive here, but can fulfill those requirements mm. moving forward. So what, what, kind of, what are these jobs, what are, what are these jobs that you can't fill here? What kind of jobs so are So I think there? probably one of the most interesting one is any position affiliated with next generation mobility. I mean, we look at the work that Sandy next and his- Next generation mobility, yep. electric cars? That yeah, way. not only electric cars, but automation. What's it look like connected and autonomous vehicles? It's something that we're working with with our domestic OEMs in Ford, GM, and FCA. You know, we got 150 miles of connected corridors right here in Macomb County where each one of those companies is testing frankly, componentry that's gonna go in the vehicles of tomorrow that's gonna to change everything from transmission plants to assembly plants here in this state. As we sit here today, less than five miles away, there's a major transmission plant, two million square feet, that GM has idled. There's another plant up in the village of Romeo, an engine plant that Ford is just saying, no, we're good, we're good there. There's 900 workers, we'll figure out how they saturate into some other market or some other uh, plant that we have. And yeah, those are strategic business decisions. But when we look at it, yeah, that's more than four million square feet of industrial space that had hundreds of employers you know, that were putting output in production to our economy. That's now pivoting. And yeah, we're engaged in dynamic discussions with our partners at the state level and also our partners at the federal level, understanding how do we ensure that that work continues to be done here when we're building electric vehicles, when we're building you know, vehicles to meet those emission standards and everything like that. It's, it's challenging, but I think the resiliency of Southeast Michigan and the state of Michigan has always met the bell. We've always got them off, up, off the mat. We've always figured out how to innovate. We've always figured out how concept to consumer, there is no other place in the continental United States, or I would even say across the globe, that can continue to meet that demand on so many different fronts, and that's something that we're working with our regional and statewide partners to keep doing. Hmm. So Sandy, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to uh, improving the standard of living for the bulk of people in the greater Detroit region in which you work? So actually, I'll go back to uh, one of the questions that came in from the audience, and is really about educational attainment. So when you look at uh, the jobs that are uh, open today and certainly going to be open tomorrow, 
roughly 78% of them are going to require a four-year degree or something equivalent to a four-year degree, you know, a two-year associate's degree with, you know, some additional skill training or, or something like that. Right now in the state of Michigan, our educational attainment rate is roughly, you know, 61, 62%. So that means 62% of our adults in this state have either a four-year, two-year, or a highly skilled certificate, like a nursing certificate or a welding certificate. So right away, we start with the delta. 78% of the jobs require that, and we only have 60-some-odd percent with those. We're already starting with that skill gap, and the, the, the skill gap that JP just talked about right here in Macomb County is attributable to that. It's not that Macomb County or the state of Michigan is lacking people. We've got people. Yep. We just don't have people with the right skills. And that is not just a Michigan story. That is, that is a United States story. And, you know, the, uh, and, you know when you look at you know, this, this technological transformation that we're going through that, you know, Molly, you just talked about in terms of, in terms of your work, you know, our nation, our, 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 the world, we go through this from time to time. When we went from the Ugarian society to the mechanical society, right, I mean, the number of jobs in agriculture dropped amazing. I mean, it was just, it, it just fell off the map, right? But we moved to other industries, right? The same thing is going to happen this time around. So there's a lot of jobs, yes, that are going to become obsolete. We're seeing it right before our faces, but we're creating new types of jobs. The challenge is that these new types of jobs that are being created require a much higher level of skill than we've had before. And just to go back to the, uh, the, the audience person who asked about, you know, uh, uh, college and, you know, do people want to avoid that? I almost think the problem is, is, is reversed. I think, th you know, between the, about the 1970s to the 1990s, uh, the American society kind of started to downplay technical skills. And we downplayed technical skills, and we downplayed uh, even things like community college. And the, the ethos was you have to go to a four-year institution. Um, and you can't, you know, remember how many people had shop, right, in high school, right? You're all supposed to raise your hand. Okay, great. This, is, you know, this is a little bit like church, call and response. You know, like, yeah, so, um, and also with you. Yeah. <laughs> That's why no one's sitting in the front row, JP. <laughs> the, um, you know, uh, but we, we lost those. We lost those things. So you talk about you know skills and skill development, stackable skills. Uh, you know, we're going to have to go to a much more nimble uh, and much more aggressive uh, educational attainment uh, uh, ethos, goal, uh, process, uh, wh whatever the right word is uh, in this society, because we're really lacking right now. Okay, but so we all, I think we all agree that investing in education is a good and necessary step. But someone, I can't remember who once told me that education is the ultimate act of faith in the future. It's an act of hope. Um, it, it, it takes, it, it's a generation. So what do we do in, for the, we, as Janet described, there are a lot of prime age, economists use the phrase prime age 25 to 54. I've discovered that, like, at age 66, I don't really like that notion. <laughs> but uh, just for the sake of... I am of 54, and I actually resent that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because but I'm soon to be I mean, 55. Something like 15% of the men between ages of 25 and 54 aren't working. And that number has come down some since the, uh, the Great Recession, but it's been steadily down over the last, you know, 50 or 60 years. So what do we do for a whole generation of people? You know, tell, great, tell your kids to go to college and they can get a job making autonomous vehicles. But meanwhile, what am I supposed to do? What, it, surely we can't write off an entire generation. Anybody got any solutions? Well, I, I'll just quickly say, I, I mean, I'm not suggesting that uh, anyone who uh, we could consider underskilled today for today's economy and tomorrow's economy, you know, has to go enroll at the University of Michigan, right? I mean, you know, talking about, you know, this micro skills, yeah. targeted skills, right? I mean, a lot of people go to institutions like this one not to get a two-year associate's degree, but to take two or three or four classes to prepare them for a particular job that's available right now in the community. And frankly, we need more of that, yeah, right? Absolutely. Especially here in this county. Mm -hmm. Right, just-in-time education. Yeah, so I mean, I think that has been a model that not only Macomb Community College has excelled in, but I think that's been a model where it's actually got the employers to bring down some of the defenses and come to the table and invest in it. It was always one of those questions when we were getting out of the recession is whose responsibility is this? Does the employer invest in the employees and put forth the capital 
needed to ensure, hey, this new line of business, this new product, this new machinery is going to innovate and make us competitive in this arena to go get these contracts. I think what we're seeing in the state of Michigan is the whole notion that, all right, obviously, as Molly was saying, and both Sandy was saying, the A word, automation. As automation is coming into play, as we're staring down the barrel of the next industrial revolution in Industry 4.0, how do we ensure that we have enough robotics technicians? How do we ensure that in a county that has 1,600 manufacturers that employ more than 72,000 individuals with an average age of 57 can continue to ensure that our production-based economy is a foundation of prosperity here and also a major driver in our nation's economy. And I think, oh, I just want to add one ahead. thing. I, mean, I, I, I think despite this, I think skills are absolutely essential and I don't think anyone wouldn't wish upon everyone the highest potential skills yeah. to navigate. But the reality is this economy is producing a lot of really, really, really low quality jobs and those jobs are not, they're growing in the future. They're just going to be different than the ones we see today. So just take the, the, the job home health aid or personal care aid. The Bureau of Labor Statistics projects over a million of those jobs are going to be added in the next 10 years. That dwarfs any other occupation you can think of, including all the buzz around IT jobs. There's a million of those jobs being added. And those are really bad jobs on any dimension that you can possibly consider. And that's a policy choice because it's really public dollars that, that fund a lot of that. Wait, wait, so they're really bad jobs. In terms of pay, stability, mobility, safety, getting hurt. These are really, on any dimension, respect. Um, I'm actually, part of my next interviews are going to be of home health aides because I want to better understand those positions. Those are jobs that primarily women and people of color and immigrants have, which is why we don't talk about them more and don't prioritize them more. We could make those better jobs, but there are a lot of other jobs that are being created that are low, that are low paid and they're low quality jobs. And in addition to all the energy and activity that's going into giving, giving people skills, we have to make those better jobs. And that's, every, that's a lot of the things we talked about. It's minimum wage, it could be sectoral bargaining. Um, but we really have to make a lift up the standards of those jobs um, because in talking with so many workers, typical workers that are not here at Macomb, there are so many barriers, particularly for adults to go back to school. They're busy, I call it in the thick of it, those prime age, they're raising kids, they're, they're trying giving. to pay their bills, yeah. they're getting up at all hours. There's a lot of barriers, financial, time, um, and even knowing what you want to do. So it's really unrealistic to expect that everyone is going to magically go back. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a, there's a job quality question. And, and I would just add one more dimension just to go to the union conversation. Um, a lot of the workers I talked to felt that their power vis-a-vis -vis shareholders or employers is really out of whack, that there's really never been a time that American workers had less voice in the workplace, and in including in making those jobs better. So in addition to skills and job quality, I think there is, at least in my personal view, I think there's really a role for, for giving workers um, more voice to improve the quality of their jobs. But the, uh, just real quickly, that issue of ed the educated versus the general population, that's what's driving that because, you know, we have so many people who are available for those low skill, low wage, I'm going to call them dead end jobs, yeah. right? That's why there's been no pressure to raise the minimum wage because that group is, is it, there's, a, there's a lot of supply there. Those with the skills, with, with today's skills, those are the ones who are doing really well and that's what's driving a big part of this, uh, of this wealth gap that we're seeing in, the, in this country that has reached European levels, right? I mean, our, our social mobility ladder in the United States has stopped. That escalator has stopped. If you were born poor, unfortunately in this country, you're now going to stay poor because of that dynamic and because of education. Which dynamics. is why, again, I think we need yeah. to intervene from a policy perspective. Uh, uh, right. I no guess, doubt. The only thing I, I, I don't like, I think we, these are essential jobs that we need to make better. Uh, we're going to need home health aides. Yes. We're going to have right. a lot of elderly people. So I think we have to be careful not to suggest that these are bad jobs inherently. They're just poorly paid, poor condition jobs. They're not, and the, we, the they're essential. Is, we right. need to make right. better. Right now, there's not a pathway. I, I, I echo okay. that completely, and I think yeah. there's a lot of people who are in those jobs are passionate about helping others. Right. right. And in fact, when we think about the jobs that are growing in demand, they're interpersonal. They're caring. Right. They're educating. It's daycare. Hard to it's automate. Care. And their hearts, they won't be automated. And, right. and the people who do them are passionate about doing them. When I say they're bad jobs, I mean 
we make them bad jobs by choice, right. by not paying. I got it. I just wanted to yes. make that clear. So I think there are jobs that a lot of people would choose to do if they were paid a decent wage and there was a path upwards. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm calling for it's is the more dignity urgency, of the, work. the dignity of the work. So Janet, I, um, for a long time, uh, I think the image of the Federal Reserve was just when times started to get good, the Fed would worry about inflation, raise interest rates, and prevent the good times from going. It's over. What's that? <laughs> it's all over. <laughs> the, all the good times are over now. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to make the opposite point. That it seems to me in the last few years, both in the end of your term as Fed chair and in Jay Powell's term, that the Fed has sort of changed its mind and felt, you know, good things happen when the unemployment rate is low and stays low and maybe lower than we thought was safe. And as long as inflation doesn't pick up, maybe we should run this experiment of very low unemployment and see if we can um, get some of these problems solved. So my two-part question is, one, is my description have any resemblance to reality? And two, do you think that we are seeing any signs that running the economy hot, as they like to say, with a very low employment, unemployment rate is helping to lift the wages of people at the bottom in these bad jobs? Is there enough shortage of labor, enough demand to make this better? Okay, so to start with, we are running that experiment. Um, in the past, a labor market, I mean, take the 1960s, the unemployment rate got almost this low or maybe this low. And by 1969, the inflation rate had risen to 5%. And that started us off on several decades of high inflation the Fed was worried about. If you had told me two years ago that the unemployment rate would get down to 3.5% and that um, inflation would still be running below 2% and maybe even falling a little, um, I would have found it very surprising. I mean, I felt, let's run this experiment. You know, we raised interest rates somewhat. We didn't, you know, we, they were at zero for seven years, and we started moving them up very gradually, but not enough to stop this experiment. It's continued, the labor markets continued to tighten, and there is, wage growth has moved up a little bit, but nothing very dramatic, nothing that is threatening to push inflation up. Um, you know, we've got about 3% wage growth. Productivity growth is running about 1%. That's consistent with inflation around 2%, which is what the Fed would like to see. Inflation's, and inflation too low is the problem. Um, for most of my life, the problem is inflation's too high, Fed has to get it down. Now the problem is inflation's too low. It's averaged one and a half percent for the last decade. And you know, one of the things that determines inflation is what people think inflation will be. And we now have a generation of people, you talk about inflation, they never experienced it. And you know, you ask them, what do you think inflation's going to be? They don't think it's going to be 2%. They think you're smoking something if you say you think it's going to average 2% for the next. That's legal now in the state of Michigan, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's good. Um, and, you know, the, the Fed has to worry about a phenomenon called Japanification, in which um, inflation is so low, inflation expectations slip, inflation falls yet more, interest rates get stuck at zero. Um, that's a world we don't want to be in. It's a world where you could even have deflation. It's a totally different world than the one I grew up in. So really, bottom line, the Fed is very focused on keep this expansion going. If anything, push inflation up a little bit. Um, we're not even at 2% inflation. And there's no reason at all to stop this experiment from running. And you know, the, the fastest wage growth now is for those at the bottom of the income distribution. Now look, those are the people who have over 50 years taken the worst hit. And when the financial crisis hit and unemployment rose, those were the people who experienced the biggest losses. So we're talking about a group of people who have suffered very serious losses for a long time, 
who are beginning to regain some of what they lost. So we, you know, we shouldn't think of this as, oh, this is totally solving the problem. But it's a good, it's a good thing, and I think it absolutely has further, further to run. Hmm. Fed's not going to stop it. Hmm. Um, Senator JP, one of the things I was thinking about when you spoke was, my impression is that a lot of the jobs you were talking about that are hard to fill are in manufacturing in some fashion, high-tech manufacturing. And I wonder whether part of the problem here is that a, lo a lot of people grew up thinking that manufacturing jobs aren't as secure as they used to be. That after all we've been through in the next 20, last 20 years with companies moving, companies folding, uh, uh, layoffs, that, uh, that you can't count on a manufacturer the way uh, a previous generation did and that they haven't overcome that yet, so which makes it why people want to go into healthcare rather than manufacturing. But that's just an impression I have. Do you think there's anything to that? Yeah, uh, that's probably been one of our greatest challenges is breaking down some of the outdated perceptions of manufacturing. Uh, our county uh, coordinates one of the largest annual celebrations of National Manufacturing Day where to date, for seven consecutive years, we've gotten more than 12,000 students into next generation manufacturers to look where the future of industry is going and actually kick the tires on some of these careers. We've not only been able to facilitate externships, also apprenticeship programs, and now we're even taking teachers, counselors, and superintendents into these shops to get them to understand how we can better connect classroom to careers. I think another arena where we're starting to see some deficiencies in ensuring that there's going to be the next generation of talent is in the skilled trades. Uh, you know, the joke that we have around the office is when we're at any of our outreach with any of our K through 12 systems and a parent comes up to me and says, I have no idea what my kid wants to do. Number two things, electrician, welder, you're going to write your mail ticket right now, specifically in Southeast Michigan. Critical skills with an economy in which we're building multi-billion dollar OEM facilities across our region in which those two positions are going to be monumentally important to ensuring those jobs get done well. So David, that's a great question. So um, our organization runs the statewide industry association for next generation mobility, it's called Machado. And one of the things that we do is that we spend a lot of time on research and data. One of the uh, research series that we do is a national survey of young people and their influencers, teachers, parents, uh, counselors, both at the high school and the collegiate level. And uh, we've been doing this now for about six years. And we ask people, you know, what is your view of the auto industry? What is your view of Michigan? What is your view of jobs in, in, in that industry? And uh, Part of what we found is not surprising. You know, I really don't want to go into the auto industry because you know it's it's too it's too volatile. But the, some of the things that we learned were uh, were really counterintuitive. So when I moved here uh, a little over nine years ago, people said, "Listen, you know, uh, because obviously I have 11 Fortune 500 companies that I report to. You know, all their CEOs are, you know, in my ear. So you got to tell people that the auto company is high tech. Our research shows that is not an issue." You know, uh, you know, people, young people, uh, people across the country, influencers say, no, the auto industry is incredibly high tech. Well, that's not an issue. Then, then what is the issue? It was ethics. It hmm. was, it was, you know, it said, you know, I don't want to send my child or my student into the auto industry because I am concerned about the ethics of the auto industry. And that makes you scratch your head for a second. And it's like, you know, every time you would do the survey, it would be something like, you know, VW Dieselgate, the GM ignition crisis, you know, something, you know, was happening. And, the, but the killer, the killer issue was, was that young people, not so much their influencers, but young people said, the auto industry is causing the problems I care about, not solving the problems I care about. Global gridlock, environmental, uh, in, environmental uh, stewardship. Uh, you know, they felt that the auto industry was contributing to those problems as opposed to what those of us who mm. are in this industry know really well is that, you know, they're working to solve those problems. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Sandy, I'll stay with you for a minute. What, uh, you've been on both Washington and now you've been in Detroit for nine years. What are the kinds of federal policies that you think make a difference in addressing the kind of issues that we've been talking about? Well, uh, one that we're, we just kind of lived through right now was, was trade policy. Right. Uh, the, you know, the, the was helpful, was it? I'm sorry? It was helpful, was it? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no, the, the, the uncertainty around uh, NAFTA in particular uh, was, was quite disruptive. Uh, I mean, you know, right now, generally, uh, generally, companies are hoarding cash right now. 
right, big time. They've got huge balances. Uh, you know, they're not laying off people, but you know, you know, companies are concerned. They're cautious. If you look at every uh, national indice in terms of CFOs, CEOs, COOs, you know, uh, uh, you know, business surveys, you know, it's either flatlined or slightly down, right? It's the it's the consumers. It's all of us. I mean, we're, I mean, those Amazon boxes are flying because we're spending money on everything that we look at right now, and it's what 71, 72 percent of the economy consumers are, right? And if it weren't for consumers, you know, our national economy would look look very differently. But I tell you, and even with that news, the manufacturing sector, automotive in particular, you know, has really been much more cautious because of the trade issues. Um, Molly, can you you started to talk on this, but what are the kind of federal policies if we were if this were a rational and calm presidential debate? Not, no commentary on on the last one. Um, uh, what what are the kind of things that you think federal government could do that would alleviate some of the tensions you've seen and make for a better uh, working place for low wage and middle wage workers? Well, I think some of these issues are are coming out in the in the 2020 campaign. Um, you know, these issues of middle class anxiety, of the struggles that workers are facing. You started this conversation saying Bernie Sanders is, is surging, Trump is in office. There's a lot of discontent. Um, so I think even since the last election four years ago, issues of work and labor are much more at the forefront of I think this election, and you're seeing candidates talk more about this. Um, whether it's support for a federal minimum wage increase for the first time in a very long time, um, to putting issues of labor more front and center. Um, I think there's bipartisan agreement on some of the conversation we've been having about better pathways to training, to apprenticeships, to the skilled trades. Um, I think that's actually not a contentious issue. Uh, we just are so far from meeting the, the needs of workers. Um, the Some of the, the the, the sentiment that I picked up in talking to workers is it's really tough to invest, it, to take time off when you need to pay your bills and enroll in some kind of training program, either in your unpaid time or in the workplace. Low wage workers typically have very little access to employer provided training to do this on the job. It's really, really challenging. This country compared to most of our peers really is very paltry. We're very thrifty when it comes to actually meeting workers and providing them with wraparound services, pathways, funding for things like apprenticeships. Um, I think all of these things are necessary. And something that doesn't come up a lot is even something like childcare is really important. Um, especially busy working adults and women in particular shoulder a lot of, the second shift came up a lot in my interviews. Mm -hmm. They work during mm -hmm. the day and they go home to a second shift. The notion that they have some extra time and bandwidth to take on some training on the side, I think, is really unrealistic. Um, so childcare, and that's something you're seeing a little bit more from the candidates in this election, trying to have more universal access to affordable childcare. Um, healthcare came up a lot as well, and I think this idea that um, people are fearful of losing their jobs because so much of our safe, safety net is tied up in our employment. Um, there might be. I asked everyone, what would you really want to be doing? And the practicalities that, that workers, particularly in that prime age, faced of needing to provide for their families and retain their health insurance served as a really important barrier to going back to school, to changing jobs, and their fear of losing jobs. Um, so healthcare, I think, is actually very pertinent to this conversation. Um, and we haven't really talked about it, but I do worry for older workers who risk displacement. Um, they have the most to lose, in my view, and are the least likely to go back to school. So I think more generous benefits to support um, workers who are displaced, particularly at the end of their career. D David, can I just build on the political thing? That, that because that's my background. That that's my wheelhouse is the political stuff. So if you if you're scratching your head and say I can't understand why people are supporting Bernie Sanders or I can't understand why you know Donald Trump you know what won the election uh, four years ago, I think there's just it all comes down in my mind to, to three three things. Number one is uh, uh, kind of building on what Molly said earlier in this panel. Right now in the United States, over 40% of households cannot afford their basic, their basic requirements. If you're, if, if you're a family of four uh, and you're making uh, roughly $62,000 a year or less, uh, you cannot afford childcare, you cannot afford you know, appropriate health care, uh, you, know, you, you cannot meet your basics. That's 40% of households in the United States. So all these macro numbers may look good, but we've got 40% of our households can. That's number one. Number two, 
you know, we, we talk a lot about the speed of technology. We can't, uh, uh, can't underestimate the speed of cultural change. I mean, you know, there, there are people in, you know, in all sorts of communities across the country who you walk up to an ATM and are wondering, why do I have to press yes for English? You know, I mean, you know, that, that's not a commentary, that's not a value judgment, it's just that, you know, that's what people are saying. So the speed of technological change is mirrored by speed of cultural change, which we've never seen in our society before, and so, and, and so, so we're, we're, we're seeing that. And then, you know, we have this, um, uh, you know, this uh, uh, either knowledge or perceived knowledge that the institutions that we as society used to rely upon, including government, uh, just seem no longer trustworthy. They seem no longer working, you know, for you. You know, it's like, you know, can government provide me clean water? Can government, you know, you know, do, do the basics? Uh, you know, uh, you know, can my, can I tr trust my church? We, I mean, we've had a lot of, you know, religious scandals. I mean, so these institutions that used to kind of form uh, the backbone of our society, what you know, what, what Harvard calls the the commons, the commons right? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> glad we both remembered that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, seem to be broken. And so if you think those three things, I mean, you know, the rise of Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders almost makes perfect sense. Mm. David, if I could hop in with one more federal issue that I think is absolutely critical here in the state of Michigan, it's infrastructure. Uh, just in our county alone, we have a $2.3 billion deficiency in infrastructure with roads that are just functionally failing. It's something that we stare down the barrel of every single day to not only develop innovative solutions, but when we have major aerospace companies that say, I'd love to build X part for YOEM, but I can't get Z reliability in the road that I'm located on, that's, that's a barrier to mm -hmm. economic growth. Mm -hmm. Right, and something which with low interest rates seems like the yeah. perfect time to borrow. JP, before I turn to the audience, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about immigration, what role it plays um, in, our, in this community and in the economy in general, and uh, explain to everybody why I'm asking you this question. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. Um, so, a uh, little bit of backstory. Uh, the Trump administration came out with a executive order uh, uh, this past fall, uh, Executive Order 1338, in which uh, local units of government were asked to certify their willingness to engage in the Federal Refugee Resettlement Program. Uh, our county, as we have done since the Reagan administration, has continued to work with our state and federal partners, not only ensured that individuals can legally immigrate here into the United States and to Macomb County. Um, one in nine county residents uh, is foreign born. Uh, we see some of the highest concentration of individuals that are immigrating here from the Middle East, and it is not only benefiting our economy, but it is providing a revival in neighborhoods where you have folks that are not only integrating into the culture here, they are assimilating into the economy, and they are providing an immense value add into everything from our educational institutions to our faith-based institutions. It's something where it definitely struck a chord with the economy, and myself and my colleagues in our office had the great pleasure of speaking to dozens of individuals that came to us with concerns about, does this mean illegal immigrations? Are you becoming a sanctuary county? No, it means that we are going to follow the strict letter of the law to ensure the highest regard of standards are met on everything with regards to the federal refugee process, but ensure that we're a welcoming economy. Because frankly, if we can make ourselves a preferred place where the federal government and our statewide resettlement partners can turn to and ensure that the services are there, the housing stock is there, the support services, the institutions, and the jobs are there, why wouldn't we engage with these partners, bring those resources here, and celebrate the fact that for decades now that it has been a positive. And personally, as a first generation American, my dad ended up here from Italy. That mattered. It was a place where him, his brothers, his sisters, his mother and father could come to and start their life. And it matters a whole hell of a lot, not only to generations of people that have continued to live here and own businesses and educate their children here, but I hope it's it actually a foundation of where our county's headed in the future, too. Hmm. Thank you. All right, your turn. I keep getting asking questions, but so there's, you need to be very popular on that side of the room. So let's <laughs> take, I'm gonna do what I did before. Let's take three questions and then we'll take another three. Hi, my name is uh, Trevor. I'm 22 and I go to Macomb here. Um, my question is to Molly, actually. Um, I'm actually the exact demographic that you were describing. I'm 22. I work at the Kroger down the street for $11 an hour. I'm part-time, but I still clock in about anywhere from 32 to 39 hours a week. Wow. And I, uh, my engine light in my car that I still owe three and a half grand on 
<coughs> is uh, just turned on. If I take that to the shop and I see the bill, I'm not sure if I'll be able to pay for it, even though I'm clocking almost 40 hours a week part-time. Uh, what can my generation <coughs> do to uh, fix that issue or uh, secure our futures going forward? Thank you. I'm going to pass the mic to there's someone in front. Yeah. Hi, my name is Michael Radke. I'm a city councilman in Sterling Heights right here. You know, I was thinking about we were talking from a macroeconomic standpoint, we can't fit people with jobs here in, here in Michigan. But I guess the issue that I'm seeing is a real brain drain, people 22 to 40, not just in Macomb County, but across Michigan. My background, I went to University of Michigan, then Columbia, then London School of Economics. I came back home, but most of my friends who are from this area who did the same things I did, and now live in New York and Houston mm -hmm. and San Francisco and elsewhere. So not only do we have a problem matching people with jobs in the area, but people who are in my demographic have just fled Michigan altogether. And I wonder if there's a, a bigger concern, not just about jobs, but about quality of life that is driving people from this area because mm -hmm. I can think about the 20 kids that I went from this area to U of M with, I'm the only one who still lives here. Mm. I think there was a gentleman in the front, Camilo. Hi, um, I'm sorry I missed most of the talk. Rather than uh, just give you the uh -oh. question, I'm going to pass this out. You can look at it. Um, I'm not going to read. Well, I suppose I could. I don't know. No, don't. Yeah, but <laughs> we don't have a lot of time, but you right. can look at it. The questions are highlighted in yellow, and basically it has to do with uh, the fundamentals of our economic system. And I guess the first question is, is what, in your view, fundamentally re reworking the economic system so that the government, instead of private banks, constitutionally creates and issues the money supply free of interest and usury. I think okay, so why don't we, that's good. Why don't we stop at that oh, one? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Molly. Can we just actually go back? Can I get the microphone to the gentleman who asked Trevor? the question? Yeah, Trevor. Right. So Trevor, I want to give you one answer before Molly does, yes. which yes. is you better damn well vote in, yeah. in the yeah. primary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> vote twice if you yeah. can. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. I don't know about that. Once is enough. Can I just ask, are you also in school here, did you say? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what are you studying? Uh, actually, I, I just decided that I would like to go into politics. Um. Hey, <laughs> I think that might be the answer. Okay. You might be driving that car for a while. I had to do a major I'm not sure about the wage level there. <laughs> so, and Trevor, actually, I would just start with you. Do you have a suggestion that you think, what would, what would policy do better to support you, particularly as you're trying to pay for school and work as you're doing it? Uh, I think the obvious answer would probably be like a wage increase. I don't think $11 an hour is cutting it. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I heard a recent number that the uh, if wages followed the inflation rate, minimum in, uh, minimum the minimum wage should be around $22 an hour. Is that correct? A little high. Yeah. A little high for that. I, Get the direction right. I'm not yeah. Sure. yeah. The direction. Okay. Yeah. It shouldn't be 7.25 an hour and. Getting paid eleven dollars an hour is not cutting either, so right. um, probably a wage increase at starting. Well, and I just I think your story is so pertinent because I heard from so many folks your age who were in grocery stores and retail and fast food. They had some kind of dream, but finances and life and all sorts of obstacles were getting in the way, particularly if they were having to finance themselves to go to school. And I call that I call this eighteen to twenty four the zone of derailment. Because for a lot of folks who don't have the privilege of having their, their tuition paid for, working and trying to make that, that uh, higher ed experience work for them is really, frankly, really difficult, particularly when those wages are so low. Um, so I, I, I feel like there's, there's a dual solution there. There's one solution that's on the work side. So how can we make that work able to sustain you better? And then the second is on the higher ed side. So what can be done better for the many working adults who are trying to go to school and accomplish some kind of dream, the car breaks down. Right. You know, I had heard stories of, of a, a woman who was almost all the way through a medical assistant degree and her boyfriend lost his job. She couldn't pay for the certificate. She ended up assistant manager at a grass station. <coughs> then she had kids and she still wanted to finish but there were so many barriers in her way. Um, so what on the school side can help sustain when those finances hit? How can we help folks like you keep going on that path so that they get that degree in hand and they were able to launch themselves into that better career? And then also, how do we make sure that those, those jobs can sustain folks who are in school or who or are not? So um, I think it's both, and I really wish you all the best, and I do hope you get into politics. Thank you. Because <laughs> you are probably the solution. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, JP, is there a brain drain here? 
Well, uh, as an Italian-American from the east side, uh, by statute, I have to live no more than three miles away from my parents. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Okay, I, so the solution is we need more Italian. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> you need the Catholic guilt and the Italian mother. Uh, no, uh, whew, yeah. So there was a discussion earlier with regards to the generation that was told that uh, four years of college was going to be the golden ticket. Uh, I, I, I fall in that generation where the only option was you had to go get that degree. And with that degree was going to be poss endless possibilities with regards to earnings and creativity and innovation. And a lot of folks like uh, Council Member Radke brought up that you know, were my cohort, you know, we, we rolled the dice, did the Chicago thing for a while, or we looked at what it was like to live in New York and everything. But I, I guess the thing that I see with regards to maybe drawing or have a little gravitational pull back is the quality of place metrics that a place like Southeast Michigan brings to you. You know, you talked about the Bay Area and the likelihood of working professionals with a family to actually functionally pay for housing in an area like that. Uh, you can stretch your dollar a little bit further here in Southeast Michigan. And I think what we're starting to see is, uh, we've actually seen a spike in individuals in that family formulation age cohort actually coming back to Southeast Michigan and per particularly in Macomb County. I think the brain drain definitely had to do with, you know, when we hit the Great Recession and what that meant with regards to industry volatility, specifically in the automotive industry and that was what that was gonna mean like for jobs. But those jobs abound, those opportunities are here and I think people are starting to take a walk about and figure out, okay, that's great that I'm doing this innovation stuff in Silicon Valley, but how can I tie that to the You know, if you didn't already have this job, I'd suggest you be a great salesman for Macomb County. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just sell hope. I don't know if you got that. I know somebody who works at the county. I can put it down. Uh, good to know. Good to know. So, uh, yeah. uh, David, can, can I we just go quick, the mic over this way? Can yeah. I just do quickly do yeah. like two things on the, uh, on the two questions that were asked? So, number one, uh, this is not my organization's official view. I'm just going to say this. Around 1900, our society said a seventh grade education was no longer enough for the increasing complexity of our society. We have had this 12-year standard now for, well, 100 years plus. Is it time to really rethink, you know, is, is K through 12 enough or do we need to make it K through 14 that is kind of, you know, the standard now in terms of how complex our society is? So I'll just put that out there because I think that goes to that young man's point. On the brain drain uh, point, uh, there's actually some uh, data on that that, that we have. Uh, Michigan has now reached, uh, after being way below the national average, we are now at the national average for uh, the, the net attraction and retention of high school talent. Uh, the, the reason we still hear the stories that you talked about is that obviously you're a high flyer, University of Michigan, London School of Economics. I've been to the bookstore at the London School of Economics. That's as close as I got to getting in there. <laughs> um, but uh, University of Michigan obviously is an international institution, so we attract a lot of people from outside the region, outside the country, into U of M, and they, and they scatter. So that's, uh, since University of Michigan is such an outsized presence um, in our uh, in our community, we have this greater view of how people are leaving, these high flyers are leaving, but nationally we're now at average. Uh, the big problem we have is that during the Great Recession, uh, when, all the pe when so many people left Michigan, for some reason, they took their children. Uh, and so we don't have their children uh, here in the state to retain them, and that's why we're, we're, we're struggling with that. So if they would have just left their children, we would have been much better. <laughs> I will, thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly Noland. I'm a U.S. Congressional House candidate for District 10. And I just wanted to touch back on one of your previous subjects. Um, about 100 years ago with the stock market crash in 1929, um, do you foresee such a equilibrium coming back to us 100 years later? Um, because the disparity in economics, obviously, 50 years, uh, well, actually over 100 years of disparity. Now it's like back then with the Vanderbilts and Mm -hmm. the big oil guys, and now we have the disparity with Jeff Bezos and Amazon. Mm -hmm. So what kind of correction, besides the stock market, because now we have a global market economy, how severe do you think that, I mean, possibly could be? Okay, is there another one over here? Uh, on your left. Um, I have a question. It's, it's great when you talk about education and getting job training and increase wages for minimum wage, but there is a gap between that and getting a job. And what I mean is that we've lost the tradition of having a job with benefits, and we get 
Instead, and even people who are middle-aged, not just the young, but people who are middle-aged, when they lose their jobs, they go back into the workforce for us, even though you get training, you're contracted, you have no benefits. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why people suffer. Yeah. The companies need to be willing to hire people even without experience, too. Because when you don't have experience, you just got training and education how can you get experience mm -hmm. if, if a company's not willing hired. to hire right. you? Right, right. So we've lost a lot of traditional values, and it's really okay. difficult for people because we do not have the benefits we used to have. Right, And right. even with unions, right. yeah. we struggle right. with, right. The with the corruption and, and so forth in the government. And okay. it is high time that we get corruption out of our government and businesses because it's, this country is about we the people, and we need to move forward in addressing that gap. Great, I got it. Thank you. No one more over here? Okay. All right, one, one here from the trustee. <laughs> Frank Cusmano, trustee. Hold on, wait for the mic, Frank. <laughs> Frank Cusmano, I'm trustee, vice chair of the board. Isn't it true that industrialization has been fueled by cheap fossil fuels and that the U.S. economy is run on cheap fossil fuels. And how does that, um, the carbon zero, blend in with that? Or are we just basically, and how are we going to tell China to slow the, because they say it's great for you guys, you already industrialized. Now we're looking to industrialize in India and we want to go forward with the same industrialization model based on fossil fuel that was in England, which is in the United States, which was all over right. the world. So how do, how do you blend that or rectif re reconcile that? So wasn't somebody assigned the easy question? I yeah. Think that person, what was the ringer? What happened to what's your favorite ice cream? Ma <laughs> Molly, no, that's a Dr. Yelling. Uh, <laughs> Molly, why don't you take the one about, um, the woman raised a good question that uh, having a job if you lose a job with benefits and you get another job and you're contracted out yeah, or definitely. you're not getting yeah. benefits, yes. you have a job, but it's not the same. How big a problem is that and what's the solution? So I think there's that problem, but I also heard this statement about the fissuring of the workplace, how work is becoming less and less stable and secure. You're contracted out as an independent contractor as opposed to an employee in-house. Those jobs often have less benefits, there's less stability. So there's the issue of losing your job and not necessarily getting benefits, but I think there was a mm -hmm. sense that over time, benefits have been eroded, job stability, the fissuring of the workplace. This is, this is absolutely true. I think the, the move toward less secure contracted out positions is a hugely problematic one. Um, there is lots of evidence that over the decades that benefits, particularly for the lower end of the wage spectrum, have become harder and harder to get. I heard it even in the context of raising minimum wage, that sometimes wages are going up, but at the same time, employers are making harder to get the benefits to the hours to qualify for the benefits. So I think this is a really huge problem. Um, and there was also a, a point also about employers taking a chance on folks who don't have skills and giving them that training. So this is, there's a question, I think, of what is the responsibility of business? And I think it even gets, this is why we're having a conversation, frankly, about capitalism and really what's expected. How do we make sure that the, the way employers are treating their workers allow for the things that people desperately want, which is stability and benefits and decent pay? Um, and I think there is a bigger conversation about the role of business. How can we potentially regulate this? But really, what's business's responsibility? And how can we get out of this race to the bottom, low level equilibrium that's causing some of these, the, these very real concerns, I think, particularly for the lower end of the wage spectrum. Okay, so Janet, there were two questions for you, each of which is worthy of a 40-minute answer, <laughs> and we got about two and a half minutes left. Okay. So one, uh, we had a lot of inequality in the 20s, and that didn't end well. Are we going to relive that? And secondly, how do we tell China and India, sorry, we used up all the carbon, so you have to find some other solution to get rich? <laughs> Well, I mean, I do think we live in an age of increasing inequality, and um, that's, that's what all of this is about and um, what people are debating uh, in the coming election. And it's taking a huge toll in American society, 
There's also um, some evidence that business, a larger share of is going to business and less to workers overall, and that the American economy has become less competitive. And so I agree with you. I think we're going through um, many of exactly the same things. I'm not sure how it ends. Um, in terms of fossil fuels and um, societies and economies that are built on it, yes, it was very important for American business. Yes, we have one of the reasons this is so hard is that we have um, countries like China and India that um, have far lower incomes than we have in the United States, have burned much less fossil fuel and put um, less carbon dioxide, fewer greenhouse gases um, in the atmosphere. And if we're not going to do anything about this problem, they absolutely can't understand why um, they, sh they should take steps that they need to develop also. But the consequence is that we're destroying um, the planet that we all need for our common survival. And um, there has been a lot of technological change. I mean, in terms of electricity generation, wind and solar have now developed to the point where for many purposes, they can just about survive in the markets on their own. Um, it's very expensive to um, tear down um, coal burning uh, elect electric plants and a sensible policy wouldn't do that, but um, when their lives are over, would make sure that they're replaced by something that emits much less greenhouse gases. And I think what I'm in favor of, and um, many people who are worried about this problem, is a tax on um, emissions of carbon dioxide that would create the right incentives for businesses um, to, make, to make the switch to um, burn fuels that are, um, don't produce um, as much greenhouse gases. So I want to thank you all for coming out in the snow. It's really heartening, and, and I was worried that it would be the four of us and three people from the college. <laughs> so I appreciate you all coming. But please join me in thanking the panel for a great discussion. <laughs>